The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me now in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 11th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 11. We'll be reading verses 1 through 13 there this morning. Luke chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, we pray for ears to hear, to hear your words, and not mine. To hear your Holy Spirit, and not the clamor of the voices that surround us each and every day. To hear you, O Christ, speak to us, call us, and call us ever on. Speak, Holy Spirit, we pray in the power of Christ's name. Amen. I wonder, who taught you how to pray? If I really think about it, I don't think anybody really taught me how to pray. And I don't mean that in a way to be sort of braggy or self-sufficient. I just mean it's almost in the air we breathe, isn't it? See, like most of you, I grew up right here in the Bible Belt in a culture where we pray before football games, before NASCAR races, before we eat our McNuggets at McDonald's, sometimes even before we get a haircut because I've not had the best of luck here lately. (laughs) I grew up uh, watching people all around me pray, watching Grandma stand at the kitchen sink and just look out the window. Grandma, what you doing? Just praying, just praying. Some folks bow their heads, close their eyes. Some preachers instruct us to do that. Every head bow, every eye closed, like they're looking at you, like a teacher looking to make sure everybody's got their head down on their desk. Some folks raise their hands. Some folks fall to their knees. I listened as some of them prayed, long-winded prayers, asking God to bless every grain of rice in the bowl and every pea in the pot. I've listened as folks have slipped into the gilded language of Elizabethan English, most of the time switching their these and thous. Brother L.C. Phillips, and I remember L.C. because, well, he was one of our, uh, let's just say, bigger deacons uh, in my home church who would come down during the offering. Also, L.C. had an old RV that we worked at at the uh, shop where I was, so I I heard L.C. say other words to other people. But he would come down, and when he would pray for the offering, and he always slipped into that, Lord, we thank thee for this, thy, this, and I don't know if he got it right or not. I've listened as folks have prayed earnestly, searching for words in times of grief and confusion. And I've listened to folks pray in such ways that it seemed to me 
that they were praying because they liked the sound of their own voice. I especially like to hear people, congregations, praying in unison. The sound of joined voices praying with one another moves something deep within my spirit. Whether they're saying, as we did this morning with Nikki, the whole of the Lord's Prayer, or whether to hear the mumbled whispers of everyone's individual prayers of the masses. I love that. Something I think we could borrow from our Presbyterian brothers in their worship style. But no one ever really taught me how. And sure, in college, in seminary, I had spiritual formation groups. There were retreats and and classes that I took. I even remember we called her Betty T., Dr. Talbert. Her husband, Charles Talbert, is a New Testament professor, both retired. We always joked about Betty T.'s Jesus elevator, she called it, where you would quiet yourself and be still and imagine that Jesus it was in an elevator at the back of your throat going down to your stomach, and when the doors opened, there would be this grand wheat field in your stomach. The metaphor always got lost on me. But Betty T. also has taught me to do what's called centering prayer, a practice, a practice daily, where you just calm your mind and your heart and listen. As Mother Teresa once said, someone asked her, what do you say when you pray? And she said, oh, oh, I don't say anything. God listens, or I listen. And they said, oh, that's amazing. What does God say? Nothing. He listens. I've always liked that. I was told about the ancient and traditional practices of prayer in the church. Written prayers, which, to be honest, I was initially skeptical of because, you know, I grew up in a small little rural church in South Alabama where you're suspicious of all things written down at church. These words of such prayers have helped to shape my own prayers, helped me to be more intentional about the things for which I pray. My friend Josh Hearn's written a prayer book I use pretty often, too. I tend to use these prayer books for my daily prayers to shape and focus my prayer time. But still, no one ever really taught me how to pray. You know, the actual mechanics of the whole thing. Because even now at 35, even now though I've been a minister for uh, on 13, 14 years now, even every so often I'll catch myself going, should I do this? Should I, should, should I, should I do this? Should I do this? Should I do this? I mean, I do it. No, bow my, yeah, just in the moment of doubt, right? No one ever taught me how to pray. Anyone ever teach you how to pray? Of course, in our text this morning, the disciples don't come to Jesus to ask him about the mechanics of prayer. They don't, they're not clueless about it. They don't come to ask Jesus to teach them to pray as if they've never prayed before or as if they're unfamiliar with the very notion. Jesus' disciples were Jews, after all, raised in the tradition and customs of ancient Judaism including prayer. They would have memorized certain prayers, no doubt, and heard many of the same prayers repeated over and over throughout the day. They would have been more than just a little familiar with the great prayers found in the Psalms, or the ritual prayers that encompassed the cultic practices of the, first, of the second temple. So when they came to Jesus in verse 1 of the text we've read, and says, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. It's not because they've been following Jesus around now without praying, as if not knowing how, as if they're completely clueless about what it means to pray. There's something more to it. You see, they wanted Jesus to teach them how to pray as John taught his disciples. Now, that doesn't mean that John taught his disciples some newfangled way to pray, some new thing to do. There wasn't some John the Baptist app that they could get, and that was what was going to teach them to pray in a new way. There wasn't anything that involved secret poses or words. But what they meant is that John taught his disciples how to pray specifically for the movement that John was hoping to see come about. He taught his disciples to pray in such a way that united them as a body of John followers. So think about it like this. John taught his disciples how to pray for those things which he hoped his movement would accomplish. Things like the revelation of the Messiah and the repentance and baptism of the masses. John's teachings on prayer for his disciples would have shaped the way they understood God and the way they understood the mission John saw himself undertaking. So this is no different with Jesus and his disciples. 
And this is why Jesus' disciples come asking, can you teach us how to pray the way John taught his disciples how to pray? They want to be united in their prayers, united in the way they understand God and the mission to which Jesus was calling them. They wanted to focus their prayers on that which defined the movement. So with that in mind, Jesus' response, his teachings on prayer, they really aren't all that earth-shaking, and I hope they're not to you. I mean, Luke gives us an abbreviated version, maybe even a more original version, of what we traditionally call what? The Lord's Prayer from Matthew. But Luke's version in verses 2 through 4 read a little differently, yes? When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to a time of trial. Now, at first reading and at first hearing, this seems like a straightforward business as usual sort of prayer because we've heard it so much. We've heard it all our lives. Even folks who don't dare darken the doors of a sanctuary on Sunday morning can at least fake their way through the Lord's Prayer. But when we take a closer look at what Jesus is teaching His disciples, what Jesus is teaching us about prayer, we can't help but notice some major points of understanding when it comes to how Jesus would have us understand God in the practice of prayer. First, Jesus tells His disciples to address God as Abba, as Father. In Greek, it's pater. In Hebrew, it's Abba. Jesus is teaching His disciples to address God as Father, and it is showing us that God is one with whom we are in relationship. This isn't like the prayers of the worshipers of Baal. This isn't like the prayers of those who worship the pantheons of the Greco-Roman gods. No one would dare enter the temple of Zeus and say, Daddy Zeus, no. They would come and grovel at the feet of the statue of Zeus. Oh, mighty, powerful, all thunderous Zeus. That's not how Jesus starts. Say, Father. This is a relationship. This is one with whom we are called to be close. God is not to be addressed as if we're writing a letter to a senator, the president of a university. There aren't dots and letters that follow after God's name. He's close. Relational, familiar. God is our Father, our friend. One with whom we can share our concerns, our joys, our very lives, even if we think the things we share with God might not be pleasing to God. Father. And while I know the term Father itself might be problematic to those of us who don't have the best Father, Jesus' point is that God is relational, loving, close enough for us to boldly share our hearts and our lives to God through prayer. But Jesus also reminds us that God is more than just a friend with whom we can have a nice conversation, that God is is more than an invisible therapist to whom we can spill our guts. God is God, the Holy Other, the One whose name is Righteous. That's why God, Jesus is so quick to remind us when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. It reminds us that the God to whom we pray is in fact the God of creation. The God of unending holiness, of infinite justice, of eternal love, and unfailing power. The one who, as I like to think, set the stars on fire. This God who is as close to us as a loving, nurturing parent with whom we live in relationship, is the same God with the power to create the cosmos, to speak the world into being, to calm the storm and bring order out of chaos. This familiar, loving, all-powerful God is the God to whom we pray. And Jesus reminds us of that with the first words of his teachings about prayer. And then he goes on to say that we ought to pray, Your kingdom come. That's the first petition. Your kingdom come. The first thing we ask to God is for God to make God's kingdom and all of its reality to come about. 
So often I think, and I'm as guilty as this as anybody, we rush to ask God for the things we want. The first prayers I can remember praying as, as even some thoughtful young adult were, God, if you'll just let the loan go through, I swear I'll go to church every Sunday. God, if you just let, if you just let me pass this test, right? It's the first prayers we pray. But Jesus says, your kingdom come. We listen as Christ reminds us that the first thing any of us should want, the primary desire of a disciple's heart, is the arrival of God's kingdom. I think that means far more than just leading our list of prayer requests with the arrival of God's kingdom. I believe that means the bringing about of God's kingdom ought to be at the forefront of our prayers and our actions, our lives. That we ought to be about the business of bringing God's kingdom to reality on earth as it is in heaven. By doing what Christ has called us to do and loving God and each other. And give us this day our daily bread. It's more than a petition for provision. It's a reminder to all of us, especially for those of us in positions of relative privilege and wealth, that all we have, all we ever have had, comes from something outside of us. That ultimately everything we have and all that we need comes from God. That's a hard lesson for me to learn as somebody who's worked very hard his whole life. To think that, no, no, the things I have are because I've worked and because I've done what I've done. It's just not true. Everything we have comes from God. Which means it's not ours to begin with. I'm reminded of a story a seminary professor told of praying for his dinner one evening. He found himself not only thanking God for the bread on his table, but for the grain that made the bread, and then for the farmer who grew the bread, and then for the baker who baked the bread, and for the, the clerk that, that sold him the bread at the store, and then for the one who put it on the shelf, and then for the one who delivered it in the truck, and on and on it went until he realized that there was nothing he owned that didn't depend on a vast web of people and circumstances outside of himself to bring it to him. If we ought to first pray for God's kingdom to come, we ought to then take the time to remember where all that we have truly comes from. The third petition of Jesus' exemplary prayer is that, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Asking God for forgiveness of sins is nothing new. For so long I thought it was the only prayer we were supposed to pray. Yet I can't help but notice the second half of Christ's petition. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Almost as if it were a condition. Forgive us our sins. For we forgive others the sins they commit to us. That's another way you can translate that phrase. That's a bit different from the version I learned from Matthew's Gospel, and I'm sure you have. In fact, churches have fought over this. Denominations have about whether it's sins, debts, or that long multisyllabic trespasses. Forgive us as we forgive others. Our forgiveness of others is implied here. It's explicit, really, not implied. It's not conditional. Nor does it follow after God's forgiveness. Our forgiveness of others is a natural outpouring from God's forgiveness to us. It doesn't end with us. In the final petition of the disciples' prayer, do not bring us to the time of trial, is a petition for God to stay with the disciples, to not abandon them when the way is trying and hope seems lost. This isn't about walking by the bakery counter when you're on a diet. This isn't about giving in to some earthly temptations. This is about when the way seems so lost and so dark that you're tempted to tell God to take a walk. Do not lead us to the time of trial. Stay with us. It's a prayer for God to be present enough to deliver us from any sort of test. But we know that Jesus himself understands temptation. 
Jesus Himself understands testing, and that such a prayer may not be answered by the avoidance of such trials. In fact, I have found, and maybe you have too, that so often those prayers are answered by God's presence in the midst of those trials. Jesus teaches His disciples to pray using this exemplary prayer, and then He rolls into a parable, because you can't get away from Jesus without a little riddle about a man who has some unexpected company at midnight. And so he turns to a neighbor for help. Suppose, he says, one of you has a friend, and you go out to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived. I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, at least because of his persistence, he'll give up and give him whatever he needs. Now, when I've heard this parable explained before, it's usually along the lines of something like this. If you're persistent in your prayers, daily, constantly bringing your concerns before God, God will eventually answer them. I want you to raise your hand right now and tell me if you've ever done that and it didn't work. That you prayed over and over and over and over. And what you wanted didn't come true. Don't lie. I have. I've sat by a bedside and prayed. And prayed. And prayed. I don't think that's what Jesus means. It's always bothered me a bit. I mean, the notion that we would have to constantly, repetitively pester God with our concerns until God was forced to answer just to get us to leave him alone. But that sort of interpretation is based upon that word in verse 8, that Greek word there, which is anadea, being translated, at least in my Bible and perhaps yours, as persistence. It's not the best way to translate that word. In fact, it's not often translated that way. It is more often in the Bible and in other places of the Koine Greek translated as the word shamelessness or boldness. He may not get up and give him what he needs because he's his friend, but because of his shamelessness, his boldness, he'll do it. That sheds a little different light on the parable, doesn't it? Jesus, especially given his words following the parable in the previous example of prayer we've already examined. You see, he's not, talking, he's not holding up to us a parable about a man who persistently nags his neighbor at midnight until he's provided bread for his guests. In fact, the parable never says anything of the sort. Instead, we need that cultural understanding about hospitality in the first century to know what's really going on. Because you see, you and I, we live in the American South, and I think we've sort of marked the corner a little bit on hospitality. But in the first century, the culture was based highly upon honor and shame. And hospitality was high. A high cultural expectation. Even at midnight. So when a stranger, or when a friend especially, arrives at your door at midnight, which was likely to happen in the days before people could get in their car and travel, before there were scheduled flights, just traveling through, it was very likely they'd stop at midnight. You were culturally expected to provide bread. And you know what the norm was? Three loaves. So when this man has no bread, because they haven't built the Jerusalem Super Walmart yet, he goes to a neighbor, hoping to avoid the embarrassment of not being hospitable, the shame. He's shameless in coming to his neighbor to trust his friend and that he will also be so bold and want to avoid the same shame of not being hospitable. Of even, and I think this is evident of his shamelessness, to not wake up his kids. You see, the point of the parable is not to be a nagging person when it comes to prayer but to be bold enough to approach God with your concerns and with your needs and with your faults, scars and all. Such a point is taken further by Jesus' following words after the parable. So I say to you, ask and it will be given. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who... If your child asks for a fish, we'll give a snake instead of a fish. Or if your child asks for an egg, we'll give a scorpion. 
So if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? My son asks for candy uh, well, every time he asks for anything. And I love, I love my son. But I'm not giving him candy every time he asks for it. How many of you, if your son asked for this, if a child asked, even though you're wicked, evil, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This isn't about getting what we ask for, but about understanding what we ought to be asking for. So when the disciples ask Jesus to teach them to pray, Jesus teaches them to pray in such a way that boldly, shamelessly addresses God as a familiar, relational, holy deity who provides for our every need, walks with us through the trials of life, so that we may boldly bring about God's kingdom on earth. We pray to a God who knows that we, what we need far better than we can ever know. Who provides for us in ways we may never fully understand or appreciate. A God who is so close that we can call on God like a parent. So when we pray, we ought not to pray timidly, as if our prayers are not important. As if our concerns are little more than a bother to God. When we pray, we ought to bring our prayers shamelessly to God. Our petitions, our concerns, our confessions. For God desires to have such a relationship with us. And when we pray, whether together as a congregation in the sanctuary or privately in our own homes and our own corners of the world, we ought to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Recognizing God as the one who longs to be in relationship with us, as the holy God of the universe, whose in-breaking kingdom should be our utmost concern, who provides for our every need and offers us the free forgiveness of his love and grace while walking with us, even through life's most trying times. May we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, with boldness so that we may live as Christ calls us to live, without shame or fear, so that we may do what Christ calls us to do, to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And this morning, my invitation for you is to pray. Whether you need to get up and come down to these steps, the altar, whatever you want to call it. Whether it's to take the hand of the person next to you and pray. Or in these next few moments, to spend the time in that consciousness of your own with God to pray. But pray as Christ taught us to pray. Shamelessly. With boldness. Praying first and above all else for God's will and God's kingdom to be done. In that spirit, would you join me now as we pray together? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, you've taught us how to pray. So Lord, now in this time, we ask you continue to teach us and show us. Give us the boldness and the shamelessness to come to bring our prayers and our hearts to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.